brethren, be strong in the Most High, and in the power of His might, and put on the whole armor of Yah, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of the Most High, that ye may be able to stand and withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of the Most High Yah. To the set apart family of the most high yeah we want to welcome you to another sword of the spirit biblical teaching i wanted to read a passage from psalms 138 i will thank you with my whole heart and i will sing praises to you almighty yah i will worship towards your set apart sanctuary and give thanks to your name for your mercy and for your truth and you have magnified your word above your name so with that having been said I'm gonna bring in my sister co-teacher of faith shabbat shalom says how are you shabbat shalom how are you praise be to god that was a, a beautiful um scripture yes I'm Hallelujah. Good. just giving praise to yah yes i am just so glad that i made it through <laughs> We got five days, and then we'll be off for two weeks. Yes, yes, in one piece because it was driving me crazy, you know, with this uh, festivities of the wickedness. Yes, oh, we know it'll be continuing. Yeah, it'll be turned up even more because it's close, drawing close to it. So I just can't wait to the break. But praise be to God. Yes, and so I'm definitely looking forward to this. So we're going to go ahead and get started with today's teaching. Today's 207th biblical teaching. This is a webinar teaching. It is entitled, Yah is Love Fully Explained. Um, I was led 
to do this teaching. Um, I ran across the scripture here uh, that we're going to be uh, breaking down in its totality, 1 John 4 and 8, where it reads that Yah is love and that who, whoever does not love does not love Yah because Yah is love. And so we know that this is something that we hear often, that Yah is love and Christianity say, well, God is love. And, you know, we hear this all the time and everyone has their own understanding of what love is or they or their own meaning of what love is but as according to scripture what is the true meaning of first john 4 and 8 where it says that yah is love and that whoever does not love does not know yah because yah is love what does this mean according to scripture is love an emotion is it an action is it a fading feeling that one can fall in and out of love at, at any time and better yet, can we fall in and out of love with our Abba Yah, okay? As we often do with people, we say, well, I'm not in love with you anymore. You know, can, can this happen with our Father Yah and our Master Yeshua? And so for many of you, how many of you are aware that there is a biblical or a scriptural definition of love that the world does not know, teach, nor promote? And so today we're going to fully explain, we're going to dig deep, okay? There's some revelations of truth about love that the Father has given to me, and I'm excited to bring them forth today. We're going to really um, hone in um, and reveal the truth. Because many are misusing, they're distorting um, this scripture to justify their own version of what they believe love is. They're using this to justify their sins, and we're going to clear it up today. This is the reason why we must study and understand scripture in context, okay? And so today, also, something that a uh, revelation that the Father has given to me, we're going to also reveal how our DNA and the two greatest commands are directly linked to true biblical love and the love of Yah. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with today's teaching. And so we're going to begin today's teaching um, with an introduction beginning at James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, where it reads, and I'm sure you've heard this, be doers of the word and not just hearers only. The Father says, otherwise, you are just merely deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forget what he looks like. And so what is this saying? James is, he wants us to understand um, the need for a mirror but it's not about the mirror it's the it's the anomaly that a mirror gets so let me let me break this down for you if you are someone who hear the word you read the word and yet you're not following or walking or obeying the word which is the scripture the word of yah and you're not obeying what the word says he says that this is just like you looking in the mirror, okay? Because he's using an analogy. It's just like you're looking in the mirror and you see yourself in the mirror, but then you walk away from the mirror. And, and, and in your walking away, you walking away, you have forgotten what you look like when you looked in that mirror, if, if you can understand what I'm saying. And so we're going to go a little bit deeper into this because James is explaining here that there is a need for us to understand what a mirror is, what the purpose of a mirror. And so let's define mirror, okay? We have them all throughout our homes in the bathrooms. Many of us have mirrors, you know, uh, decorative mirrors in our um, living room, uh, maybe in your bedroom, but mirrors are pretty much everywhere. So let's define it. So Merriam-Webster de defines um, a mirror as a polished or a smooth surface as of glass that forms images by reflection. So there is a reflection. When you look in the mirror, there is a reflection. 
Now, Wikipedia says that it is an object that reflects light in such a way that the reflected light preserves many or most of the detailed physical characteristics of the original light. It's called a specular reflection. And so that light is going to throw back or uh, the original image of what was standing in front of it. Um, yourdictionary.com says that it is a surface that reflects um, anything that gives a true image of a person or a thing. So it is going to reflect or give the true image of a person or a thing. This is what a mirror is. So when you're actually looking in the mirror, you're looking at the true image of yourself or the person or the thing that is in front of that mirror. Strong Hebrews for mirror 4759 says that it is actually a vision, okay? A looking glass, it's a vision. And the source.com says it is a glass that reflects image, Im that reflects an image. So when you look at all of these definitions and meanings for mirror, one word that stands out in all of them, you see is reflection. Reflection, 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 over and over and over again. So when you look in the mirror, you are going to see a reflection of yourself, right? And so being that we keep seeing reflection, it's been redundant. Let's go over the definition for reflection, okay? Wiki Wikipedia says that reflection is a change in direction of a wavefront at an interface between two different media so that the wavefront returns into the medium from which it originated. So as I stated earlier, when something is reflected, it is something that throws back, okay? Something that returns, okay? Um, Dictionary.com says that reflection is an image seen in a mirror or a shiny surface. It is the throwing back, as I stated before, the throwing back by a body or surface of light, heat, or sound without absorbing it. So a mirror is not going to absorb, okay, the image, but it is going to throw it back, okay? And then it also says for reflection, um, uh, dictionary.com says reflection is a serious thought or consideration. So you think about us who are in education, we're often asked, uh, asked our students to reflect back on the lesson or reflect back on maybe some of the concepts that we've taught. And so when you're asking your students to reflect, you're asking them to give back what the, the original concept or teaching or the skill that you were trying to teach them, you want them to give it back. You don't want them to give you uh, back an understanding that you hadn't taught. And so when students cannot reflect, and they're giving you something that you did not teach, um, then you know that their understanding um, is off. Um, what they think they saw or understood is not what's really in front of them. So it's when you give a serious thought or consideration to something, just as you see this uh, tree here is, uh, is, is seeing a reflection here in uh, the pond. Okay, so uh, vocabulary.com says that reflection um, it is to throw or to bend back from a surface, um, to manifest or bring back, okay, to show an image of, um, to reflect also means to give evidence of the character or quality of something. I like that. That reflection means to give evidence. It means it is evidence of the character or quality of something, okay? And so you're able to see the proof, so to speak, in the pudding. Um, it's gonna give the evidence. So when you look in the mirror, okay, whatever I see in the mirror is what is there, okay? And so when I, I looked this up in uh, thesaurus.com because I wanted to see what some of the synonyms are gonna be for reflect. It says to reflect, um, if you're reflecting, it means to follow, okay, to copy to imitate, to return. Think about that in the scriptural terms, to follow, to copy, to, to imitate. When you imitate or copy anything, it is exactly as advertised, okay? To return, we think about the Father Yah is always asking us to return, but what is it 
that he says that we are to return to. He talks about his chosen people, Israel. They don't even know where to return. They have no idea that they do not have an idea of where to return. What are they to follow? What are they to copy? What are they to imitate? And then it says to take after. When you take after something, you're pretty much doing the same thing, okay? And so the word of Yah is the mirror. As when we think about believers, the word of Yah should be our mirror, that which we follow, that which we copy, that which we imitate, that which we take after, that which we as his chosen people should be returning back to, right? And so the question, okay, that I want to ask is, what is James saying in James 1 verses 20 through uh, 22 through 25? Okay, so I made some bullets here because I wanted to make sure I didn't forget. So what is he saying? He's saying that the doer of the word examines himself intently in the mirror, which is the word of Yah. These are those who actually do what his word says. They're looking intently in that mirror, which is the word of Yah. The doer examines him or herself which, with much care and concern and in detail, in great detail, seeking all blemishes and or imperfections so as to get a true perspective of the image that the mirror is reflecting. And then the hearer, these are those who hear the word, they read the word, but they don't do what the word says. Okay, the hearer, they turn away without regard for what they have seen in the mirror. This is James said, they look in the mirror and then they walk away and immediately forget the person um, that they were. They look in the mirror and they see the imperfections, but then they walk away and act like, oh, well, I'm good. You know, this is the hearer. They turn away without regard, okay? Without paying attention. When, when you do not regard something, you do not observe, you do not attend to, okay? And then also, the hearer, despite we, what he or she has just seen, does not take the time to fix the blemishes or the imperfections. He or she leaves the mirror, which is the word of Yah, and continues as he or she was, deceiving him or herself into thinking that he or she is better, aka they're better with the, the imperfections or the blemishes. They think that they're okay with these imperfections. They're okay with the blemishes. It'll clear up on its own. I don't have to do anything about it, right? And so what image is being reflected? When you look in the mirror, what image is being reflected back? Okay, what is the reflection that is staring back at you? Are you, are you looking in the mirror and seeing something or someone different than who you are? Okay, is that, is that what you're saying? Are you looking in the mirror when you look, you're looking intently, are you noticing the blemishes, the imperfections? that are there, okay? Are you disgusted by them, okay? Do you, do you pick at them? Do you leave them alone? What do you do? Are you, when you see these imperfections, are you trying to correct them? Are you putting on the blemish cream? When you're in the mirror, you see the acne. What are you doing? Are you just leaving it there? Do you put any blemish cream on it? Do you try to do things that you know that's gonna clear your face up? Therefore, who you were before, you are no longer that person again. What do you do when you look in the mirror? Because when you go in the world, the world will tell you, I am perfectly happy with my perfect imperfections. They say that it is, um, your imperfections are perfect, right? They have books out talking about the gifts of imperfection, okay? Let go of who you think you're supposed to be and emb embrace who you are. Do what thou wilt, right? They got all kinds of quotes. Your imperfection is perfectly beautiful. Okay, they got blogs about it. How I learned how to accept my imperfections when the Father and when Yeshua, our Master, told us in Matthew 5 48 that be you therefore perfect, for even your Father which is in heaven, he is perfect, right? And so the great misunderstanding comes from not understanding um, what it means to be perfect. Okay, people say, Oh, well, no one's a 10, no one can be perfect. You know, I'm just a man in his flesh. So let's define perfect because this is where it comes. People do not have an understanding of what perfect. The Hebrew word for perfect is time, 
And Tam, Strong Hebrews 8535, means to be complete. It means one who lacks nothing. That means that you are mature, that you are sound, and that you are wholesome. Um, Tamam um, means to be whole, to be finished, to be complete, which also means to be undefiled. Okay? That means you're set apart, upright, blameless, and plain because we know our master is coming back for a bride without spot or blemish he knows that we are in this flesh but if you have his spirit you have the power to overcome sin you do not practice sin um mikhail mcleal um he builds four three five nine i do my best to try to um, pronounce these words it means completeness okay so to be perfect means that you are walking upright that you are undefiled, that you are blameless, okay? You are mature um, and you're lacking nothing. It does not mean that you are without sin because if we were without sin, there would not have been a need for our Messiah to come, okay? But let's go to some uh, precepts um, because people say, well, no man was perfect. Well, why does our scriptures tell us that there were men who were righteous that were perfect, Job as being one? Job 1 and 1, it says, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared Yah and eschewed evil. He hated evil. He had the fear of Yah him. He was perfect. He was upright. He was complete. He was whole, um, undefiled, meaning he was set up. He kept himself set apart from the world, and he was upright. Job 1 and 8, and Yah said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that fears Yah and hate of evil? Okay, so again, Job is being called perfect and upright. Psalms 37 and 37 says, Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. So the scriptures are saying that the perfect man is upright. This means that if you are keeping Yah's commandments, that you are not practicing evil. It doesn't mean that you will never sin, but you do not go on willingly, purposely sinning and walking in unrepentant sin. You are quick to correct your errors and you are not continuing to keep repeating those same sins over again, okay? And Paul even talks about his desire to be perfect in Philippians 3, 12 through 15. Paul says, not as though that I have already attained it, he said, either were I already perfect. He said, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Yeshua Messiah. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, meaning to have obtained this. He said, but this one thing I do. He said, I forget those things which are behind me. Remember this. He says, I forget those things which are behind and I'm reaching for into those things which are before me. He said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of Yah in Yeshua Mashiach. So there is a high calling on our lives. We have been called to be perfect because he says, be you perfect for your father who is in heaven is perfect. He says, be holy for I am holy. So when people go around and say, you can't be perfect, no one's perfect. You're, you're calling the word a liar because he said that you are to be perfect. Perfect does not mean that you don't make mistakes, but a person who is walking upright does not continue in willful sin. They don't practice lawlessness, meaning they're walking around an unrepentant sin, they're sinning, they can fornicate, and they can go to sleep at night and, and have no problem. They're, they're not convicted in their sins. There's no way that someone who's serving Yah can continue in fornication, continue in adultery and stealing and lying and doing the things that you know you're not supposed to be doing, not if you have his spirit, not if you've been born again, okay? And so he says, Paul says that, I'm, I'm not saying I've already attained it or either that I were already perfect. He said, but I am pressing towards the mark for the prize of a high calling. He knows that this is a high calling. Verse 15, he says, let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded and and if if anything be otherwise minded yah shall reveal even this unto you so the goal should be perfection our goal should be pressing towards the mark to be perfect to live when he says to be perfect that means to live 
a righteous life, to live upright. To live upright means to keep your set up, yourself set apart, unstained and tainted from the world. You're not blending in with everybody in the world. You're obeying the commands of God while everybody else is out doing other things. These are those who are considered perfect, okay? Doesn't mean you haven't made mistakes and you have not done things that are wrong because we're all continuing to still learn about Abba Yah and his ways. And as we learn of him, we make those corrections as he reveals and we come into that revelation. So let's revisit this again. James 1, 22 through 25 says, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Otherwise you are deceiving yourself. So he's saying you are deceiving yourself. If you think that you can just hear the word, you can go to church, hear the word from the pastor, go uh, read the word in the Bible, but then yet there's no change. You're still walking in your sins. He said, you're like somebody that's looking in the mirror. And then after you look at yourself, you see the imperfections, you walk away and you act like you didn't see it. He says, he is like a man who looks at himself, his, or looks at his natural face in the mirror. And then after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forget what he looks like. He says, but whoever looks intently, we're going to talk about this, whoever looks intently into the perfect law, which is a Torah, the commandments, that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what he heard, but actually doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So he's saying, look, those who actually look intently into that mirror, which is the word of Yah, and then you actually make the changes that you need to make, okay? Because of the word of Yah should be what we should be measuring ourselves. That's the what we should be examining to see whether we are um, in uh, the faith or not. But he says the man that does this actually does the word, not just hearing the word, but actually doing what the word says. He says that you will be blessed. So people going around saying, I'm blessed and highly favored, but yet you not keeping the commandments. You're not blessed at all. You don't know what blessed means. So again, are you looking intently in the mirror? Are you looking intently? When you're looking intently, to look intently means that you're looking with much concentration, okay? You're looking with much concentration. You're looking like someone would look and under a microscope, you're looking closely, you're searching, you're seeking, you're carefully seeking with much thought. This means that you are seriously seeking and examining yourself so as to take heed and to conform to the ways of our creator. This is what you're doing when you're looking um, intently because the whole goal is to seek and find and examine yourself to see, your, see if you're in the faith find those imperfections, change them, and conform. Conformity is the goal. Now, some of you, uh, many of you drive a car, and we in the car, we have a, a rear view mirror, okay? Are you, are you looking um, in the rear view mirror? You know, what mirror are you looking at? What is a, the rear view mirror? What's the purpose? The rear view mirror gives a view of the area that's behind you, but not what's in front of you. What did Paul say? He said, I am pressing towards the mark, forgetting the things that are behind. Okay. He's, he's pressing towards what's in front of him. He's not concerned because what's going on behind you is not giving you an accurate picture of what's going on in front and what you really need to be paying attention to, right? So are you looking at the rear view mirror, okay? Or maybe you're looking intently and examining yourself in a window, okay? A window, unlike a mirror, allows light and air to enter in, okay? So you're looking at, you're seeing um, outside influences, okay? And so I want to briefly help you to understand the difference between a mirror and a window. A mirror is a reflection of what is standing before you, whereas a window, okay, a window gives you a view of others, okay, maybe others that you see yourself in, okay, maybe others that you want to be, you know, this is, 
how the spirit of jealousy runs rapid even among the brethren. You're looking at other people's gifts. You're looking at the talents that he may have blessed them with. Um, it, you may be jealous of someone on your job. The, the whole point is you're looking at a window. You're looking at a view of others instead of looking in a mirror where you can get that reflection that is going to throw back to you what's really in front of it, okay? James is saying in James 1 and 22 that if you are a hearer of the word, but you're not a doer, he said you are only deceiving yourself. You're looking at a window. You're looking at a rear view window, but you're not looking in the mirror that's going to give you the true reflection of who you are. And for many of you, you're going to be just like this dog on the screen, barking at yourself, looking at a mirror like, this can't be me. Who is this person in this mirror? He's surprised. Look at this dog. He's surprised. He's barking at his own self. These are dogs that run around and see themselves and, uh, you know, bite their own tail because they cannot believe this is not me. When, when, when animals get a true reflection of who they really are, and you've ever had an animal and a first time an animal has looked at themselves in a mirror, how many of you have had an animal and you're looking and you're watching this animal and they're looking at, at, at themselves in the mirror and they're barking at themselves. They're like, who is this? They're surprised at what's staring back at them because a mirror is going to give you the true reflection of who you are. And for many people, they're gonna be surprised just like this dog at what they see, okay? They're gonna be just like that cat looking in, in, in the mirror thinking that he's a lion and he's really um, Leo. So Paul is saying because of this fact, we need to examine ourselves to see if we are truly in the faith. We need to be looking in that mirror, which is the word of Yah, to see if we are truly in the faith. So what does Paul mean when he says, examine yourself? Okay, well, we're going to start with, because the, today, the title of today's teaching is Yah is love. And we're going to fully explain what does that mean me yah is love what is love according to the bible and so let's define it and we're going to go straight to the scripture we're jumping right in no chaser second john 1 and 6 says and this is love that we walk according to his commandments this is the commandment even as you have heard from the beginning that you should walk in love so Second John 1 and 6 is telling you right off the bat that this is love. And what does it say? That we walk according to his commandments. This is what love is. Love is keeping his commandments. That's what love is. First John chapter 5 verses 2 and 3 reads, By this we know that we love the children of Yah, when we love Yah and keep his commandments. For this is the love of Yah. What is the love of Yah? That we keep his commandments. Uh, once again, once again, we're looking at another scripture. See, pastors do not read John. There are very few pastors that I know will read John because John is no chaser. He's straight up from John to 1 John. Second John, it's all about love is keeping his commandments. Again, first John 5 and 3 says, For this is the love of Yah. What is the love of Yah? That we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous, meaning they're not burdensome. You know, like, oh, I gotta keep the Sabbath. Oh, like you know, someone does does not take find joy and delight and his commandments, it's not, it's not grievous, it's not hard. This is love. Sin is the opposite of love. You don't believe me? Let me show you. First John chapter two, verses three and four, sin is defined. By this, we can be sure that we have come to know him. 
if we keep his commandments. I'm going to read this again. First John chapter two, verses three and four. He says, this is how you can be sure that you know Yah. If you keep his commandments, for anyone who says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, he is a liar and the truth is not in him. Are you looking at this? He's saying that if you say, I know him, how many Christians do you hear <laughs> say, I know him? Oh, I know God. Oh, I don't read the Bible from cover to cover. He doesn't care how many times you've read the Bible. He want to know, are you obeying the Bible from cover to cover? That's all he's concerned about. He doesn't care about how many scriptures you have read. You're just like the one who heard the word, read the word, but you're not a doer of the word, right? He says that if you say, I know him, but you don't keep his commandments, you are a liar and the truth is not in you. This is a very sobering scripture and is a very hard scripture for many people to come to terms with because I remember a coworker and I were having a conversation and we talked about, we were talking about the commandments and I asked her, well, why don't you keep the because she said she knew him and she loved him. And I said, well, you keep the word? And she said, yeah. I said, you keep his commandments? She said, yeah. I said, okay, so you keep his Sabbath day? And she was like, well, she started stumbling with no, and, and, and I don't think that he would. And I'm, I'm like, she went into the thing. I said, well, he says that if you don't keep his commandments, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. You know, it's to quote this back to someone, it's not that you're trying to offend them. It is what it is. And this is a very sobering scripture for many people. First John 3 and 9, anyone born of Yah refuses to practice sin. Do you understand this? Why is he saying that you're a liar if you don't keep his commandments? He says, because if you are truly born of Yah, meaning you have his spirit in you, anyone that has Yah's spirit refuses to practice sin. Something that you practice is something that you do habitually, something that you do on a regular basis, something that like when I was in the world, I was constantly at the clubs. I was, I was fornicating. I didn't care about um, if I'm sleeping with somebody that I'm not married to. I didn't, I didn't care about honoring the Ark of the Covenant. I didn't, I didn't care and know anything about the veil of Yah and know anything about why he says that your body is the temple of Yah. And if you if you um turn a body into a whore, you know, and, and you're whoring and he his spirit is in you, you, you're sinning against your own self. You are sinning against your own soul. Fornication, you're that's the only sin that you're sinning against yourself. You're sinning against your own body. All the other sins are sins that you commit outside the body. But when you're fornicating, you are sinning against your own body. It's like you taking a knife and you're stabbing yourself. So if you're listening to this teaching and you're fornicating, please repent because you have no idea how serious the sin of fornication is, okay? You cannot be, you can be keeping the Sabbath, you can be, not murdering, you could be not stealing, you could be keeping every commandment possible, going to church, studying, doing all of that. But if you're still fornicating, you have not um have self-control over your lower loins, you that's you're just being religious. He can't move in you, he can't use you, all those other things. You might as well just stop doing all the other things. Ser fornication is is very serious, especially because our body now is the temple that he dwells in. So again, anyone that is born of Yah refuses to practice sin because Yah see abides in him. And therefore, what does it say? He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of Yah. So let's go into some precepts. John 14 and 15, Yeshua says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So this is, I mean, it doesn't get any clearer than this. This is why pastors don't teach on this. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Plain and simple. 
John 14, 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father. Once again, he said, whoever keeps his commandments is the one who loves him. So if you don't keep his commandment, he's saying that you don't love him. You in actuality hate him. John 14, 23 through 24, Yeshua replied, if any man loves me, he will keep my word. He says, if anyone loves me, you will keep my word. You will obey my word. You will do what I tell you to do. He says, and then my father will love him. Do you see that? Then my father will love him. Y'all does not love everybody. So please stop going around and quoting something that you learned in Christianity that's not in scripture. Yah says in his word that he loves those who loves him. And I don't have that scripture off hand. Prina, if you can, if anytime by the end of this teaching, if you find that, we can just reveal it at the end. Yah says that he loves those who loves him. Period. Okay. There is no such thing that he loves everybody. It's not in scripture. Okay. He does, there's no such thing as unconditional love. You don't find it in scripture. There were conditions. And there are conditions for loving God. There was, if he has unconditional love for his people, how did we end up over here in America? Why were we sent on those transatlantic uh, slave trade? Why are we suffering the curses of Deuteronomy 28? Why did he divorce the Northern Kingdom? Okay, if there, why, if, why is it? Why, because they were committing adultery. They were whoring. They didn't obey his word. So there's no such thing as unconditional love. Everyone on the planet has conditions on how you to be loved. That, that doesn't even make any sense. That's like saying, I'm gonna be in a, a marriage or relationship, a marriage with someone and you can keep cheating on me and I'm not gonna say anything. Oh, you can slap me in the face. I have no conditions. Oh, I unconditionally love you. Oh, you can pop me in the mouth and knock all my teeth out. I'm unconditionally love you. Oh yeah, I drink your pee. I'm, uh, I, what is this? I mean, seriously, think about it. Every, everything and everyone who cares about structure, there are conditions for everything in life. There's no such thing. We have conditions on how we're to be treated when we go to a hospital. There's a, a, a minimum standard of care that patients, whether you have insurance or not, there's a minimum standard of care that they want to see in the field of education. Okay, there's a the, the way that a child should be taught in the classroom. So there's no such thing as well. I can just be in the classroom and I, there's no um, conditions. I can just sit up and put a big bird tape on and eat grapes and keep my feet up on the desk. And uh, eventually they'll learn how to read. That's not how it happens. There are conditions. No one can keep their job without fulfilling the duties that were laid out in that contract with that agreement. So to say that our father, Yah, has no conditions and we can continue on in sin and we can continue to break his commandments and then we're going to slide in the kingdom. Where is this doctrine in scripture? He says in John 14, 23 through 24, that if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and will come to him and we will make our home within him, meaning we will, they will live in us. He says, but look at verse 24. But whoever does not love me does not keep my word. And the word that you hear is not my own, but it is from the father who sent me. Okay. So sin is defined, okay, in 1 John 3 and 4. And then we're going to continue through verse 7. Sin is the opposite of love. Whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Another version says, everyone who commits sin also breaks the law. Sin is the breaking of the law. So when you break Yah's law, this is what sin is. How many, you ask the average Christian or the average believer, what is sin? They're going to tell you, I had someone recently um, 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 in an Uber, um, she, she asked, she wanted to know why I wasn't celebrating Thanksgiving. And I have never had someone in an Uber that I'm literally, this lady is being contentious, arguing, going back and forth about my faith and trying to support 
why we should celebrate Thanksgiving and Christmas. Now, of course, this is her own thought. And I believe that JC thinks that he wants us to celebrate holidays to honor him. I said, well, where? It's not in scripture. And so we make up things instead of allowing the mirror, which is the word of Yah, to accurately reflect what his word says. Many of you are reading your mirror and the Bible you reading is, is the mirror um, that you find at the, the circus, okay? You're, you're looking at a rear view mirror. You're, you're looking in a window, okay? The windows have outside influences. The windows allow light and air and other things to come through, but it's not throwing back at you what is in front of you, okay? And so, 1 John 3 and 4 again, whoever commits sin transgresses the law, for sin is a transgression or the breaking of the law. But you know that the Messiah appeared to take away sins. We find this in Romans 8, 1 through 3. He did not come to do away with the law, but he came to fulfill it. To fulfill does not mean to do away with, but it means to obey, to uphold, to enforce, to keep, to obey, okay? Romans 8, 1 through 3, he tells you that he came to do away with the law of sin and death. When you read Romans chapter 6 and 7, okay, Paul talks about two different laws. This is the reason why many of you, if you do not understand Paul, and Christians in particular use Paul, and they have no understanding of Paul, because if you don't understand Torah, you will never understand Paul. Okay, and that's why the scripture says that Paul's writings or his letters are hard to understand and those who are unlearned twist them to their own destruction. You're going to twist his scripture all the way to hell because you're teaching people that part of his word is dead. Okay, that's pretty much what the law is done away with doctrine means that part of his, his word is dead. Okay, but he says that the Messiah came to take away sins. He came to take away the law of sin and death. That's the only law, not Yah's teachings and instructions. He says, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning and no one who continues to sin has seen or known him. To know him is to understand him. Proverbs 9 and 10 says that knowledge of who Yah is, is understanding. Okay, so if you don't know who Yah is, you have no understanding. He says, little children, verse seven, let no one deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as the Messiah is righteous. Verse 24, whoever keeps his commandments abides in Yah. Let me say this again. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in Yah and Yah in him. And by this, what do you mean? What is it this? By those who keep his commandments, this is how you know that he abides in us, by the spirit whom he has given us. And so in Matthew chapter seven, and this was the scripture I'm getting ready to read here. And I've shared this several times. We've been listening over the last four or five years since we've been doing this. I've shared this numerous times. Matthew seven, verse 21 through 23, which I'm getting ready to read. This is what actually saved my life. This, I was reading this in scripture and my spirit was quickened. And I cried out to the father and I said, I want to know who you are without vain, tradi tra vain traditions and teachings from men. And I said, Father, reveal yourself to me, just as Moses did. And he did. He told me I must keep his Sabbath. And so these people here, Matthew, they thought that they were saved only to get to judgment day and to find out that they weren't saved at all and that they were on their way to hell. And I was just really grieved in my spirit when I read this. And I'm so grateful that I cried out to the Father to reveal himself. And my life has never been the same. And that was 15 years ago. But Matthew 7 verses 21 through 23 says, not everyone who says to me, master, master, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. On judgment day, he says, many will say to me, master, master, we have prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name, and have performed many miracles of wonderful works in your name. We have done all these things in your name. We gave to the soup kitchen in your name. We gave to the homeless in your name. I did many nice things, okay? Gave to charities. But he says in verse 23, 
because you did not keep my commandments, because I told you those who love me keep my commandments, but because you were a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word, he says in verse 23 that I will declare to them that I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Do you understand this? He's simple. So the lawless are those who are the commandment and Torah breakers. The commandment breakers are those who do not love Yah. They are those who are without love because love is keeping his commandment. Those not loving Yah are those who do not look intently in the mirror, which is the word of Yah, thoroughly examining themselves that they might conform. So let's go back once again and revisit James 1, through 25. Be you a doer of the word and not just hearers only. Otherwise, you are deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror and after looking at himself, he goes away and immediately forget what he looks like. But whoever looks intently, okay, who looks intently, this means that you are looking with much consideration, much thought, carefully seeking and searching. You're serious when you examine yourself so that you can take heed and to conform to the ways. He says those that look intently and to the perfect law, which is the Torah, and, and the Torah are, is his commandments, they give freedom. Those that continue in it and do not forget what they heard, but actually do it, he says they will be blessed in whatever they do. So the Torah, which are the commandments, is the perfect law that gives freedom, freedom from sin. And so many people talk about grace, grace, grace. Well, what is true grace? True grace warns and teaches against sin. When we read Titus 2 and 11, it says, For the grace of Yah, who is Yeshua, the grace of Yah that bringeth salvation, has appeared unto all men. We know that our master Yeshua appeared. He is the grace of Yah, according to John 1 and 1, teaching us that we ought to deny unyaliness and worldly lust, and that we should live soberly, righteously, and yali in this present world. So we should live upright, okay, set apart, blameless. He's saying that you should be perfect. Okay, and so when this doctrine is going around that says that the law is done away with, if there is no law, <laughs> there is no love because his law is love because Yah is love. What is love? We just, I read a billion scriptures just now. Love is keeping his commandments. So if there is no law, then there is no love. And the Messiah never taught freedom from the law of Yah. He never taught that. And so people say all the time, I love you, I love you, I love you. But how do you prove to someone that you love them? How does a husband prove that he loves his wife? How does a wife prove that she loves her husband? They're faithful to one another. They are committed to one another. They're loving and kind to one another forgiving one another, being forbearing with one another, patient with one another. They're, they're, you're attentive to one another. You're, you're devoted and committed to one another. How do friends show that, they're, that they love each other? Same way, because you're loyal to one another. You respect one another. You care for one another. You love your brother as you love yourself. So how do we show Yah that we love him above all else as commanded? And by what standards should we follow to prove this? Because to say that I love you with no action is not love at all. We just learned this. He says, if a man loves me, he will keep my word. If you love me, you will come keep my commandments. Because this is love, that you walk after my commandments. We've read a billion scriptures. 
So saying you love someone with no action is not love at all. This is should be sobering. I can't say I love my husband. He can't say he loved me and we're not faithful to one another. We're not loyal to one another. We're not committed to one another. We're not forgiving and forbearing and, um, and, and, and loyal. We're not, it, you, you just not. If I'm cheating on him, he cheating on me. That's not love. I'm, I'm committed to other people. That's horn. That's not love. You understand? I don't respect my husband. He doesn't respect me. That's not love. I can't say Prina is my best friend and I love her and she's and I'm her best friend and she loves me, but I'm stabbing her behind her back every chance I get. I'm talking about her to other people. I'm jealous of her. I hate her in my heart. I'm happy when she has something uh, a bad or a downfall. That's not love. That's not a friend. A friend rejoices with one another. When she hurts, I hurt. When she's happy and joyful, I'm joyful and happy. So to help us to make this plain and clear, we're going to go right into Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40, which talks about the two greatest command. An expert, so far expert, you know, the Pharisees are always trying to catch our master Yeshua in a lie. So the, one of them asked, teacher, what is the greatest command in the law? And so Yeshua replied to him, you shall love the Most High Yah with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest command. So the, there are 10 commandments. The first four commandments teaches us how to love and honor the Father Yah with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind, okay? And then when we get to the second, which he says in verse 39, is just like the first commandment that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is the remaining six commandments. And the remaining six commandments teaches us how to love our neighbor as ourself. Our neighbor is our friend. And our friend, as you learn, if you haven't checked out my Yah Talk, go to, to uh, my Yah Talk channel. And um Talk about is the that lesson? I think it's entitled "What About Your Friend." Um, I put a copy of the link to that lesson um at in in this um uh, teaching on YouTube. So if you go to when you if you listen to this, just look in the comment section. It'll be a link to go to my other parent channel, which is Y'all Talk, which is uh when I do mini lessons of twenty minutes or less. But he says that the second commandment is just like the first which means you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He says, all of the law, meaning all the law of Moses and the books of the prophets are based on these two. So when people say that the law, the law is done away with, are you looking at what the Messiah said? He says that the two greatest commandments, the first is to love Yah with all your heart, mind, and soul. That's the first four commandments. And then the remaining six of those 10 teaches you how to love your neighbor as yourself. He said, on these 10, hang all the law of Moses and the books of the prophets. So the law of Moses and the prophets, the writings of the prophets, all of them are based on these two commandments, these two greatest commandments, which in totality are our 10 commandments. So people come, oh, can't nobody keep all them? Or oh, we, we keep the commandments. If you're talking about the commandments, you're talking about the Torah. You better have them go back and read Matthew 22. This is what you say. If they tell you it's done away with, he's telling you that the all 10 are in totality, the law and the prophets put together. And so the law is the standard of love, the Torah which is encompassed in his entire Ten Commandments. The law of Yah, his teachings and his instructions, is the standard of love. And so now let's get into fully explaining Yah is love. Because people say, well, God is love. Okay. But what does that mean? I have it a question mark, not as so to question it, because um, it clearly tells you that um, that Yah is love, but what does that mean? 
What does it mean when it says that Yah is love? Because people have their own definition in the world of what love is. They love to quote, well, the one who does not love does not love God because God is love. Okay, what does that mean? They love to quote this scripture and they try to use, misuse the scripture and distort this scripture to make it appear as if this is what love is. Look at this, love takes over. They want you to think that this is love. If you actually um, love what y'all love and hate what he hates, okay? Y'all have said that this is an abomination that a man should not lie down with another man. And so they call this love. And, and the homosexuality and LGBT community, they say, well, love won, right? This is what they say, okay? This is their definition of love, but this does not go with the commandments of the Torah, that my father God says, this is an abomination. Anyone that does these things is an abomination. Anything that he, there's an abomination is something that he hates and that he detests and abhors, okay? Anyone who's a homosexual will be in a lake of fire if they do not repent. And so it says in 1 John 3 and 11, for this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So what does that mean? What, what is that message that we should love one another? Now we're going to fully go in and explain Yah is love. So the next time when somebody, well, God is love, they try to throw this at you, send them this lesson, send them this lesson, okay? So they know what this means. So 1 John um, chapter 4, we're going to begin at verse 7. Um, Apostle Paul is saying, beloved, let us love one another because love comes from Yah. So we are commanded to love one another because love comes from Yah. Everyone who loves has been born of Yah and knows Yah, but who does not love does not know Yah because Yah is love. So we just think for a second. And let us reflect, because we learn what reflect means, okay? To throw back what you heard from me earlier and what we read in scripture. Let's throw back. Let's look in that mirror, which is the word of Yah. What have we learned thus far? That it says that everyone who loves has been born of Yah. That means everyone who keeps his commandments has been born of Yah. I mean, you have the spirit of Yah and that you know him. Because remember what he said, that if you say you know Yah, but you don't keep his commandments, he says, you're a liar and the truth is not of you. But if you keep his commandments, you have been born of Yah, and therefore you know him and have understanding of who he is because you obey him, right? Are you getting what I'm saying? And so whoever does not love, meaning whoever does not obey him and does not keep his commandments, this one does not know Yah, because Yah is his commandments. He is the Torah. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So if you look here, there are two different definitions in verse eight for love. So the love that is being used first is G25. This is according to the Blue Letter Bible. So whoever does not love um, G25 does not know Yah because Yah is love G26. So the Blue Letter Bible for Love in the context in which it is being used and the first time it ate and read, it means to be fond of, okay? To be well pleased. And the Blue Letter Bible for Love, um, G26, it should have been a six there, I didn't go back and put that there, um, means affection, goodwill, brotherly love. Okay, we're gonna go into what does that mean? Because anyone has goodwill for you, they want your best interest for you. We know brotherly love, because I talked about this plenty of times. We just got finished talking about brotherly love when he says you are to love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, this is the second greatest command. So let's read this again. Beloved, let us love one another because love comes from Yah. Everyone who loves has been born of Yah and knows Yah. Whoever does not love, meaning who is not fond of, um, does of his brother does not know Yah because or 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 not fond of his word or his commandments because Yah is love. Okay, so this love where Yah is love is affection, goodwill, brotherly love. So I looked up the source.com for affection because it says that Yah is love, meaning he is affection. So affection means strong fondness, the same thing we just looked at for love in um G25 that he told us to be um, fond of. 
Okay, so the source for affection says strong fondness, being sympathetic, which means to be responsive. To be responsive means to be sensitive, to be aware, to be kind-hearted. So when someone is telling you that you're doing something or you're saying something or something about your behavior is bothering them, is hurting them, okay, is making them feel bad. If you truly love them, if you truly have the affection and the strong fondness of them that you say you do, you are going to be responsive to that. You're going to be sensitive to that. You are going to, you're not going to dismiss them, but you're going to be aware of it and you're going to be kind and tenderhearted towards them to make the changes. It says affection also means to care. So this means that you are caring. Um, there's a closeness that's there. It also says affection means devotion. When I looked up devotion, it says loyalty. Okay, you are loyal. You are, you are committed. There's a commitment that's there. You are committed and that you serve this person. Okay, it says friendship. These are all things that Yah is love. Okay. We definitely know that he is kind hearted, that he is sensitive, that he is aware, that he responds to us, that he is uh, fond of us, that there's a strong fond of us. He sent his only begotten son to die for us. So you don't tell me he, there's not a strong affection for his people. And he said, what is it that you are an angel of man, that you are mindful of him, you, that you made him a little bit lower than the angels? There's no greater love than someone who laid down their life for you. So he was devoted to us. There was a loyalty that's there. Loyal to his oath and his commitments. He has he's been committed to us. Friendship. And then goodwill. What is goodwill? It means charity. Okay, you are going to be kind. You're going to be helping others who are in need. There's kindness there. Kindness, it says, is mercy. We know that our Father is merciful. It says forgiveness. We know that our Father, Yah, forgives sins. He is forbearing with us. He has not repaid us for the nick. We all were worthy of death. But he sent his son to die for us. Endurance. Those who endure to the end shall be saved. Grace. He sent his grace. He showed us grace again when he allowed his son to die. Do you understand? You have grace every time you wake up because you have another opportunity to get it right. Grace, do not insult the spirit of grace by willfully sinning. He, it says that goodwill means that you are concerned. That's someone who has their, 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 if they have their best interest towards you. They're concerned about you. They're not, con they're, con they're not concerned about, okay, well, I got to tell you something that you don't want to hear that you're going to stop talking to me. They're concerned about your soul, where your soul goes when you leave this earth. They, it says that goodwill means to regard. To regard anything is that you are mindful. What is it that you are mindful of man? That you made him a little lower than the angels. You give attention to, you notice. How can someone say they love you? But yet, there's no kindness there. They're mean. They're unforgiving. They show you no mercy. They're not willing to be forbearing with you. Every time you do something, they're ready to call it quits and just give up on you. They're, 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 there's no grace that's there. They're not concerned about your well-being. They don't regard you. They don't, they don't want to pay no attention to you, spend no time. They don't notice you. You don't bought a new dress. They don't notice you. That's not somebody that loves you. I'm just using that as an example. Yeah, you understand, understand what I'm saying? This is what it means when Yah is love and he expects for us to be the same way with our brethren, to have a strong fondness of. Look at it, G25, to be fond of to be responsive and to be sensitive, caring about others, being aware. There should be a closeness that's there, a loyalty, a commitment. Sean Hebrews for affection 157, I mean, sorry, for love, 
strong Hebrews 157 for love, it says that it's affection. The same thing we just got finished looking at Blue Letter Bible. Strong Hebrews says that love is affection. All these things we just got finished talking about. Strong Hebrews 7355 says love, especially to have compassion on or upon, to find, to have, to obtain, or to show mercy on or upon another person. What do Yeshua say? Verily, verily, I say unto you, in so much as you have done it to the least of one of my brethren, you have done it unto me. So then the, 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 the disciples, they're like, well, what, the, you know, well, what did, when, when did we see you feed the hungry? And when, when did we, we didn't feed you. We, we, didn't, we never gave you water when you were thirsty, when you needed something to drink. They say, well, when do we do these things? And what did Yeshua say? He said, we, they said, we did we see you as a stranger. And then we invited you in and, and, and gave you the things you needed, clothes. And 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 when when we when, when did we see when you when were you ever sick? And when were you in prison and we went to visit you? And it says that Yeshua will reply. He says, I will tell you the truth. He says, whatever you did. For the one of the least of these brothers of mine, he said, you've done it unto me. So if you see someone has a need and you and you give to them, you're being, goodwill means to be selfless. You're not selfish. When you see someone else has a need, you give it to them. You understand? He said, you have done this to them. He said, you're doing it to me because they're my brothers. Why? Because we are main members of one body. When one member hurts, what does the scripture say? Everybody hurts. When one is joyful, the rest are joyful. Let your pinky finger, you get a headache and you get a headache bad enough. You get one of them headaches, your whole, everything in your body hurting. Your stomach hurt, everything. Do I just understand what I'm saying? Why? Because what happens to one member of the body, it affects the rest. I want to show you two precepts now. The glory of Yah, aka love, was shown to Moses. I'm going to show you this. Yah revealed this to me. And I said, how awesome. The glory of Yah is love. Yah showed Moses love. I just got finished going over all the definitions where in, in 1 John 4 and 8, it says that Yah is love. And we went over all those billion definitions of what it was in context. Moses asked to see the glory of Yah. And Yah said, I'm going to pass by you and I'm going to show you all my goodness. Goodness was one of the definitions for love. Exodus 33. Y'all granted Moses his request. He said, I'm going to show you love. Then y'all came down in the cloud and stood there with Moses. And he and y'all called out his own name, Yah. Then y'all passed in front of Moses and called out. Yah is calling out his own name. And then he's going to tell you what his name means. He says, Yah, Yah Almighty, merciful love gracious loving kindness love slow to anger love being forbearing and enduring abounding in steadfast love again love that's commitment that's loyalty that's goodness and true met his word is true his commandments we has already told you is love Maintaining loving devotion to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, forgiving love. We just got finished going over this. <laughs> the glory of Yah was shown to Moses. Yah showed Moses love. The fruits of the Spirit. AKA love 
was revealed to us in scripture via Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Same thing. The same thing Moses saw. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, love, kindness, love, goodness, love, faithfulness, love. Same word. It's so many synonyms that mean the same thing. I will have to scroll back so you can see it. Gentleness is love because that's loving kindness self-control is same thing as love because you it takes loyalty and commitment to be self-control it takes loyalty and commitment it takes self-control to be loyal and committed and be married to someone for years and never cheat on them and never commit adultery on them. do you understand what i'm saying it takes loyalty and it takes love the love of yah to to, to not fornicate when, when you're not single. Are you understand what I'm saying? He says, against such things, there is no law. So let's reread 1 John 4 and 8 in context to get the true understanding. Now that we know what it means when he says that Yah is love. Because what we read is not what the world, what's going on in the world and how they have distorted this scripture to justify their sins. 1 John 4, 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another because love comes from Yah. Everyone who loves has been born of Yah and knows Yah. Whoever does not love does not know Yah because Yah is love. This is how Yah's love was revealed among us. Yah sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Are you looking at this? There is no greater love. There is no greater kindness. There is no greater loyalty, commitment, faithfulness, every word that we saw, mercy, grace, that it goes on and on. There's nothing, there's no greater love than what he did. He did that so that we might live through him because he says that if we, if a man obeys his teaching instruction and we walk according to his commandments, he said, if a man lives by, if a man follows them, he shall live. If a man walks in his ways, he shall live. Who is the way? Yeshua says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Love consists in this. Not that we love Yah, but that he loved us and sent his son as the um, atoning sacrifice for our sins. He, he sacrificed his son for us. That's love. He was forgiving us. When y'all walked past Moses, did he not say one of the words was forgiving? Forgiving iniquities? Forgiving sins? Merciful? Was that not mercy that he was showing? Beloved, if y'all so loved us, we ought to love one another. I'm going to say this again. If y'all so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen y'all. But if we love one another, y'all remains in us and his love is perfected in us. This is how you know you have love in you. He says if your brother or sister has a need, and you can walk past them knowing you have the means to help them. He said, the love of Yah is not in you. If anyone confesses that Yeshua is the son of Yah, Yah abides in him and he and Yah. And we have come to know and believe. Look at this. We have come to know and believe the love that Yah has for us. See, the love that Yah has for us is not the love that the world has. The, love, the world fall in and out of love with you one minute you on top, these celebrities, and the next minute, R. Kelly was on top at one time. The world loved him at one time. Now he has 
fallen. <laughs> they don't want nothing to do with him no more. They ain't in love with R. Kelly no more. Do you, are you understand what I'm saying? But that's not the love of Yah. He says in verse 16 that we have come to know and believe the love that Yah has for us. His love is not fickle. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He changes not. He says, Yah is love. Whoever abides in love abides in Yah and Yah in him. Verse 17. In this way, Yah, I mean, in this way, love, which is Yah, love has been perfected among us. This is how Yah is perfected among us. When we walk in love, as per all of the definitions that we've learned and what love is and keeping his commandments, this is how Yah is perfected among other people. Why? He says, so that we may have confidence on the day of judgment. He says, because in this world, we are just like him. What does he mean that we are just like him? We are a reflection or a mirror image of him. If the word is the mirror that is in front of us, remember a mirror reflects back. It throws back the original thing that is in front of it so if the bible the word of yah is the mirror and we are keeping his commandments because we have intently looked and we are searching and we are seeking to change these imperfections then we are a reflection of him we are a mirror image of him Okay, again, 1 John 4 and 8, where it says that we are to love one another as we love ourselves. We are to love one another, and if you do not love, then you don't know Yah because Yah is love. This is talking about in the context of loving your neighbor as yourself. That's what this is talking about. All the law of Moses and the books of the prophets are based on these two. You're not going to be able to get away with, get away from the Torah because the Torah is encompassed within the commandments. You're looking at it. This is the Messiah telling you this. So let's talk for a moment now about being created in his image. Okay. Because as I stated earlier, let me go back. We are expected to be the image bearers, to be the exact reflection when Yah looks down or from heaven and, and looks from his throne and he sees his chosen people his we were supposed to be a mirror representation he should be able to look down and say there's my image you know like the like the father said by the son you to chip off the old block he wants to see <laughs> that word reflected back into the earth. We are to be the expression, the walking expression of his word, which is love. This is why we were created. And he tells us in Genesis 1:26, Yah said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And so Yah created man in his own image. In the image of Yah, he says that he created them and he created them male and what? Created them male and female, right? Okay. So let's, let's look at this in context. It said that we were created in his image and in his likeness. Blue Letter Bible in this context said the likeness is means of his resemblance. It's a reflection. Strong Hebrews 6754. The root word meaning to shade. Think about the shade. Think about when you walk past something that gives a reflection and, the and, and you have the shade and you can kind of, it's kind of, you can make puppet faces. It's giving a reflection of what it sees. It says likeness, a representative figure. I talked about this on a previous teaching. A representative, if I can't go to a business meeting and I send my representative, I'm sending someone who, they're going to speak the same words that I will speak so that whoever they're speaking to is as if they're speaking to me. 
That's why Yeshua said, I don't come to speak my own will, but I come to speak the will of him who sent me. When the disciples said, well, when can we see the Father? He said, look, you've been with me all this time. How can you ask me to see the Father? He said, if you've been with me, you've seen the Father. Because I and the Father are one. The source.com says that um, image in the context in which it's being spoken of is a representation. The same thing that strong Hebrews and blue letter Bible. It says that it is a copy. It is a duplicate, a match. A carbon copy is something that is exactly the same to the T, like identical twins. Can't tell the difference. He should not be able to tell the difference. If you represent him, there should be, now he should be able to tell the difference between you and those who are in the world. If you look like a carbon copy of the world, you are not representing him because you are not being a reflection of him. This is where me and my people go off because we want to conform to the world. But those who are in his image, it says that his likeness, the source.com says for likeness, it says it corresponds in appearance. It corresponds to something. It is identical. It is, and then look what it says, conformity. It conforms. It says sameness. It is the same. So it says carbon copy. So I looked up the source.com for carbon copy. It says it's a mirror image. We started off with James because I wanted to break down and help you to understand the purpose of understanding. James views the um, analogy of a mirror to help you to understand the purpose of what a mirror does and then try to um, con make the connection to the scriptures. But a carbon copy, it says exact likeness, a mirror image, a clone. We all know about clones. They got plenty of clones for these celebrities that's out here. You think that it's, it, they, they got them. You can't even tell. It says a double, a duplicate. You go make a copy on the copy machine, it's going to print off the same thing that is being reflected on that screen or the image, right? Splitting image. And so what happened? Because he says in the beginning that we were created in his image and his likeness. What happened? And is man still made in his image? Are we still made in the image of y'all? So now we're here to get into some stuff. This, I'm going to show you the DNA connection to the current image of man. Okay. So DNA, okay, we all have it. DNA is a molecule that contains the instructions that an organism needs to develop live and reproduce. So again, your DNA, everyone has DNA. Your DNA in, in, in the simplest terms for you to understand, the DNA contains instructions, okay? And they tell an organism what it needs to live, to, to develop and to reproduce. It tells every cell and everything that's going on in your body, what to do, when to do it, how to do it, where to do it, and all of those things. Your body receives instructions on how to function, how to live, how to develop, how to grow. How do you think we grow? That DNA is giving it instructions on how to grow. And these instructions that are found inside our cells are then passed through Okay, they pass through the parents to their children. So just like us, I have instructions. I have been given instruction. I've been given instructions on how to raise my child. Okay, and I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. The instruction is the word of Yah. Okay. And the instructions that I give, if his word is in me, I will then pass it on to my son. And so I want to take a look at this because I'm trying to help you to make the connection with the DNA to the current image of man. Because I asked you the question, is man still made in his image as we were initially? First John 2 and 28 says, 
And this is, he says, and now little children, abide in him that when he shall appear, meaning Yeshua, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. He's saying abide in him. When he says abide in him, he says keep his word so that when he appears, you're going to have confidence. And you're not going to be ashamed. You're not going to shrink back at his coming. So the question I have is, where do we find a similar account like this happening in scripture? Shame. Genesis 3, verses 7 and 8. And at that moment, this is talking about Adam and Eve, after they took from the tree of knowledge and good and evil that he told them not. He says, in the day that you eat, you shall surely die. It says, at that moment, after they ate from that tree, it says that their eyes were open and they knew that they were naked. When it says they knew, that means now they have an understanding of what they have done. They have an understanding of evil. They now have an understanding of something that they didn't have an understanding of before. They have an understanding now that they have sin and transgress the laws or the commandments of Yah. They didn't know anything about that before. They disobeyed him. So it says that they knew, they understood that they were naked. They understood now that I am uncovered. I am uncovered. So what did they do? They sold fig leaves together to cover themselves. And they heard the sound of the Most High Yah walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And it says that Adam and his wife hid themselves. They hid themselves from the presence of Yah among the trees of the garden. Are you looking at this? They knew they were uncovered. They understood that they had done something wrong. They understood that they had sinned, that they had broken his law. And so they understood, oh, I'm naked. Oh, I'm uncovered. So what did they do? <clears throat> they hid themselves. From who? From the presence of Yah among the trees of the garden. When did we just learn? What did we just learn? Now, little children, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Did, did they have confidence at his coming? Did, were they ashamed? He says that we be not ashamed at his coming. They were ashamed. And that's why they went and hid themselves. We know this to be true. Something happened. Because in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, before all of this went down, it says that the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. When they were walking in obedience to the commands of the Father Yah, they were not ashamed. They were naked and they were not ashamed. But now all of a sudden, now that they have disobeyed Yah, when we get to Genesis 3, 7, and 8, now they know they have done something wrong. Now they're uncovered. So let me go hide myself because I am ashamed at the coming of my Abba Yah. Are you looking at this? And you're seeing the connection? Let me go back to 1 John 2 and 28. Need to write this down. This is a precept. First John 2 and 28 is a precept to uh, Genesis 3, 7 and 8. They wouldn't hid themselves because they were ashamed. They were not ashamed before. What happened? So in the beginning, the scriptures tells us that man was created in his image. And so if Yah is love, as we know, and love is keeping his commandments, what happened? Because 
man who is Yah's creation is clearly not keeping his commandments right now. We know that man is not obeying Yah. They're not keeping his commandments, which is love. And we know that Yah does not sin and does not have the nature to sin. But in the garden, what happened in the garden and when Adam and Eve disobeyed Yah, their DNA changed. Are you listening to me? The DNA changed. Prina, I have read before what changes happen. Okay? Their makeup, the DNA is the makeup. Their change, their DNA change, their makeup change. Our protection, our covering was removed. Are you listening to me? So prior to their disobedience and the breaking of his commandments, man did not have the sinful nature. And so ever since then, man has been trying to get back to its original state without love, without AKA keeping his commandments. Are you listening to me? And so within the DNA itself contains the instructions again for how to live, how to develop, how to reproduce. And we also learn that within the DNA, within that cell, within those instructions, those instructions are passed on through our parents, okay? He was our Abba Yah. We originally, we were made in his image, in his likeness, but something changed. What does he say? That he gives his spirit to those who what? Obey. What happened? Romans 5 and 12 tells us, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, so also death was passed on to all men because all men sinned. This is what happened. Through Adam and what was done, sin entered the world through one man and death came from him through his sin. And so also death was passed on to all men. Why? Then what do we just learn about DNA? DNA contained the instructions on how to live, how to develop, how to reproduce. And when they disobeyed Yah, they became uncovered. Something happened. Why is now death being passed on to us? It says that the instructions in the DNA is passed on through the parents. Well, we know that Adam and Eve were our parents. What did they pass on? They passed on the simple nature. Are you looking at this? I'm, I'm hoping that you're looking at this. Paul talks about this in Romans 7 and 20. He says, now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it. He said, but it's the sin in me. It's the sin that dwells within me that does it. This simple nature that was passed on to me through my forefathers, Adam and Eve. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Look at this. Death came through Adam, through his sin, but through Yeshua, if you obey him, and you keep his commandments, just as death came through sin, life can come through righteousness, living a righteous life, being perfect and upright, being set apart. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And so the Bible talks about the sinful nature, aka the flesh, aka being carnal, the carnal man. And so we have the propensity to sin because it's hardwired now. It's hardwired in our DNA. Since they did what they did, it's now hardwired. Okay? We're not forced to sin. He always gives us a way out. Okay? But due to Adam and Eve, we now have the tendency to sin. 
okay? I can go without sinning because I have his spirit, but do I have the tendency to sin? Yes, because it was passed on through my parents, Adam and Eve. And so what I'm saying is this, anything that is hardwired doesn't have to be learned because it's passed on from generation to generation. We have been passed on our curses. They have been passed on from generation to generation to the chosen people of Yah. Anything that is hardwired doesn't have to be taught or it doesn't have to be learned. A, ba a baby, when they born, they know how to come out and, and suck on the mom's boobs. Mine did. He knew right away what to do. Trust me. Things, babies don't have to be taught how to cry. <laughs> they know how to cry. And they know that when they cry, it means I'm going to get attention. That's why they doing it. They let you know that I need attention. Something wrong. They can't talk. How do they know that? Because it's already built in. That is built in hardwire instructions within their DNA. They didn't have to learn it. It was passed on from their parents from generation to generation. And so what did Eve, what did Adam and Eve pass on to us? They passed on to us the simple nature. They passed on to us the tendency to sin. Are you understanding what I'm saying? This is what happened. Our DNA changed. And it's the very reason why we have to be born again. Colossians 3 and 16, he says to put on your new nature, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of his creator. Put on the new man. Put on your new nature. I went and died to set you free from sin. Put on the new nature. Are you understanding? If you've been born, if you've truly been born again, baptized by water and by his spirit, and you have his Ruach HaKadosh, his set apart spirit, he said that he gives his spirit to those who obey. If you obey his command, he'll give you his spirit. Those who are led by the spirit of Yah are the sons of Yah. So when you carry out the teachings and instructions, which is the Torah, the law, when you carry out the teachings and the instructions, do you understand that you are a son of Yah? You are now a son of Yah because your nature is being renewed from the old simple nature that was passed on through Adam. And now you're being a new creation, a new create, a new creature. That's why you're being born again. That's the only way. This is how you know the children of Satan who are the children of error from the children of Yah by those who keep his commandments because their nature is being renewed. You ever met someone and they used to be just the most horrible person, simple, and now you see them and they're, they're, they're walking in the word. They, they live their life completely different. They're not who they used to be. That's a new nature. Our DNA is changing. Do you understand? Do you not think Satan knows this? Do you not think he knows that our nature is being changed and took bread is being, look at this, it says renewed, not new. It says it's being renewed in the knowledge because the DNA contains the instructions for how to live, how to develop how to reproduce it's being renewed in the knowledge of what it originally did in the beginning because he says in the beginning that we were creating his image in his image he says i created him this is not i bet you this teaching is not the yah is love or the god is love lesson you've heard before i can guarantee you This is what our people need to hear. This is what's going to transform and change lives. Not the foolishness that they talking about in church. God is love and I can continue in my sins and he love everybody and he knows my heart and I'm just a sinful man and was me. Repent from this foolishness. 
and be saved. Psalms 40 and 8, David says, I delight to do thy will, O my Yah, yea, thy law is within my heart. Look at that. He says, your law is in my heart. Your Torah is in my heart. So the Torah is our DNA. The Torah is our instructions for life. The Torah is the instructions on how we are to live and how we are to develop and to reproduce. The DNA is the instructions for how to live, to develop and reproduce. And the Torah contains the teachings and instructions for how we are to live, to develop and reproduce. As I said, precept Isaiah 42 and 21, Yah was pleased because of his righteousness to magnify his instructions and make it honorable. Are you see this? Yah was pleased because of his righteousness to magnify his instructions, meaning his DNA, and to make it honorable. So who are you going to be today? How many masks are you going to wear? How long are you going to play church? How long are you going to be lukewarm? -y? He told us in Nehemiah 9 and 29, he says, you warned them to turn back to your law, but they were arrogant and disobeyed your commandments. They sinned against your ordinances, by which you said that if a man practices them, he will live. Are you looking at this? All of these precepts are backing up what I just said. He says that if a man practices his commandments, that he will live. It's not. The DNA contains the instructions for how to live, develop, and reproduce, just as the Torah contains the teachings and instructions for how we are to live. If you carry out and live out the Torah, the teachings and instructions, you are a son of Yah. You are being renewed, renewed, and putting on that new nature, and you're being renewed daily, going back to the original creation. You, you getting ready to be that mirror image that we were before our DNA changed. Because it changed, because we didn't have the simple nature. Our Abba Yah, he was their parents of Adam. Yah does not have a simple nature. So where did he get that from? He says, you are of your father, the devil. Matthew 19 and 17 says, if, and notice how I have it underlined and in red. If you want to enter life, he says what? Keep the commandments. So there's a trap that is being set right now. There, there's a trap that's being set with our people. There's a trap. And that trap is the law is done away with doctrine. That means his teaching and his instruction is done away with. The trap is, is that you believe that there is life apart from keeping the commandments. The trap is that you believe that there is love outside of keeping Torah. The trap is that you think that there is life without instructions. The trap is that you think you know and love Yah without keeping his commandments. Okay, the trap is that you think that you are in covenant with Yah, that you know him and that you love him, yet you don't keep his commandments. The trap is that you think that you can live in unrepentant sin, you can practice lawlessness all the way up until time for judgment day, and then you think you're getting into the kingdom. The trap is that you think you have his spirit, yet you have no power to stop sinning. What did he say? By their fruits, you shall know them. Titus 1 and 16 says, they profess to know Yah, but through their actions, they deny him. They are detestable. They are disobedient and they're unfit for any good work. He can't use you for the kingdom. He can't use you. Are you understanding what I'm saying? This one is a good one here. Yah led me to this scripture before um, I ended because I was done with this teaching. Jeremiah 5 and 2 says, Yah says, 
Although they say, as surely as y'all live, <laughs> got their hands up high, as surely as y'all live, y'all say they are swearing falsely. Although they say my name, they use take my name in vain. They say, Lord, Lord. <laughs> he says, yet yeah, they do not what I say. He said, listen to this, O house of Jacob, you who are called by the name of Israel, you who have descended from the line of Judah. He's talking to you so-called African-Americans. He said, you who swear, you swear by my name, you swear by the name of Yah, as he said in Jeremiah 5 and 2. He said, you swear by my name, you invoke the almighty one of Israel. He says, but you don't do it in truth or in righteousness. You have a zeal, but not according to righteousness, not according to truth. You swear, but you swear falsely. Oh, I know him. Oh, I'm saved and sanctified. Glory to God. Oh, how I love JC. He said, you swear falsely. You take my name in vain. They say as surely as Yah lives. This is the churches of today. Rebellion is their gospel. And disobedience, they call freedom. They call good evil and evil good. The spirit of rebellion is the DNA that is running rapid in the churches of today. They hide behind grace to conceal the true manner of their heart, which is to disobey him. They want the salvation, but they don't want the obedience. They want to cherry pick, buffet what scriptures and what commands they want to obey. They love to use, oh, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Oh, no one is perfect, you know? But what they don't understand is when you have Yah set up our spirit, if you have his spirit, you have been empowered from on high to be able to refrain from practicing sin. You now have the ability to obey his word and to keep his commandments. So you don't, if you have his spirit, you can no longer use the excuse of not being able to keep his command. You can't use that excuse any longer if you have his spirit in you. Because the Holy Spirit, his set apart spirit, convicts you of sin. It teaches you all things. It leads and guides you. Only those who do not have his spirit continue in sin and continue to practice sin. That's why they're unable to please Yah, because they're in the flesh. And any man that's in the flesh cannot please Yah, because the spirit and flesh are enmity. There's mutual hatred between the two. But if you are in him, if you abide in him and he abides in you, and you've been baptized by water and by spirit, you have his work, Hakadesh, his Holy Spirit living in you, you now have the power to live a life of victory over sin. That's why I always pray, do not allow sin. To, to, to master me. Do not allow me to be successful in sinning against thee. Don't allow me to mess up my own salvation. I pray this all the time. Don't let me mess up my own salvation. You know what's best for me. Don't allow sin to have dominion over me. He says, Yah says, our people say they love to swear as surely as y'all lives. He said, but they ain't gonna do nothing that I say they don't obey. Oh, they don't obey me. They are swearing falsely. Are you listening to what I'm saying? So it is time for us to return to the mirror. It is time for us to return to the mirror, which is the Torah. The Torah gives you a true reflection of who you are. James 1 and 25 says, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law, that's the Torah, the commandments, that gives freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from sin. Freedom from death. 
freedom from the old nature. If you look intently into the perfect law and you continue in it, not forgetting what you've heard and what you've read, but you actually do it, you actually obey it. He says, you will be blessed in whatever you do. Are you, when is the last time you really look at yourself in the mirror? When is the last time that you have intently looked at yourself? Have you looked at your imperfections? Have you looked at your blemishes? your fallings, your shortcomings? Have you looked at yourself and hated the imperfections? Do you seek to conform and change? What, tra what changes have you made to clean up those imperfections, to get rid of them? Yeshua says in Revelations 2, 5, therefore remember from where you have fallen. Go back to that mirror, not the rear view mirror, not the window, but go back to the mirror that is going to reflect, that's going to throw back the image that is in front. Yeshua says, remember therefore where you have fallen. He says, repent and do the works that you did at first. If not, what did he say? I'm gonna come to you and I'm gonna remove your lapstand from its place unless you repent. He said, unless you repent, return, he says, to your first love. We talked about the seven churches. He says, you return to your first love. Have you fallen out of love with me? Are you not keeping my word anymore? Are you not committed? Are you not loyal? Are you not faithful? He says to repent. Remember where you have fallen. How are you going to remember? Go back to the mirror, the word of Yah. And examine yourself and see if you're still in the faith. Examine yourself intently. Search hard. Search hard. Do you understand what I'm saying? Look intently, closely, seeking with much thought, with much consideration, examining yourself so that you can take heed and to conform. Continue to walk in the true love of Yah. I pray that this teaching, Priya, you can come in, has blessed you. Today, I pray that you have a thorough understanding of 1 John 4 and 8, where he says that Yah is love, and that he who does not love does not know Yah because Yah is love. I hope you understand how our DNA changed, how the image changed, how we are to this day. We're trying to get back to his image and be a true reflection, be a true representative of him in this earth. When he looks down, he says, there's my image bearer. There's, I, I had and I heard, I heard and I shared this with you, that you are the light, you are the light that will bear witness of he who walked the earth. That's a, I have a high calling on my life and I know that. My mom told me when I was born, I was covered with a veil. I was covered from the beginning. He had a call, I had a calling on my life from, from birth, from before he knew me. It's no coincidence that I'm doing this. Prina. My man says, praise be to Yah, Toda Yah. Awesome. Oh my goodness. Um, I just, uh, one, want to give that scripture really quick before I go into, uh, yeah. the, um, oh, where um, y'all love, yes. love him. So that's Proverbs, <laughs> Proverbs 8 and 17 says, I love those that love me and they that seek me find me. So yep. I, that is Proverbs 17, I mean, 8 and 17. And I also want to give another scripture that really hit home. Um, it is, keep my commandments and live. Mm. And my teachings as an apple of your eye. Woo! And that's Proverbs 7 and 2. I was reflecting on this all week. And I was, um, and that really hit home and it really registered today. Um, because I've been, you know, seeking Yah and trying to go higher with him. And that really, really struck a chord. When you, 
was talking about that love. I'm like, oh my goodness, I got to mention this <laughs> at the end. Mm -hmm. But um, praise be to Yah. I love how you first went to John and talked about Yah's love. And then um, going to James, um, you know, uh, 1, 22 through 25, and just talking about the mirror and understanding a clear purpose of what he was really saying. I love how you reflected on that. And also, um, not only just going from there, but just being a the difference between a doer of the word and a hearer of the word. Mm -hmm. um, that was just really uh, uh, the analogies that you gave really set the tone so that those that are listening to the lessons know the difference between a doer and a hearer of the word. And then um, just going into just what is love? What the, the the biblical definition of love as Yah himself and what he has declared as love, not what man says love is, but just what Yah uh, says in his Torah is love. And then just, I love how you also um, talked about the opposite of love, which is sin. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, we as uh people you know we don't we equate love like you said um i love yeah and you know he's a uh 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 he loves he loves the sinner and not you know oh yeah hey that's that favorite one well, uh loves the sinner and not the sin uh, you know all the clashy cliches that we have been brought up with in in the wicked church systems that we feel that is death to us that we don't know that is death to us but I just love, you know, just going into that and just talking about the two greatest commands. And then what put the icing on the cake was the DNA. Mm -hmm. And how the instructions, you know, and, and just looking like, you know, just examining uh, Adam and Eve as our parents and how they put on, you know, tra transferred that sinful nature. Uh, at, that was just awesome in itself. So I really praise be to Yah. Yeah. And I love how you talked about the image, you know, and really giving, um, uh, going in thorough definitions about what the image is and the carbon copy and the mirror and relating it back to, to James. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, I, I, I mean, in all, it was awesome. And I pray that listeners, really 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 share this because they will get a thorough understanding of what Yah's love truly means biblically yes i mean yeah it was um I, I learned a lot from this um just truly just being able to connect the fruits of the spirit and uh moses seeing the glory of Yah that he was actually showing love that that was his love that he was showing moses when moses asked to see his glory oh yes 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 sis i remember yes i am that was love he was showing them love all the attributes and everything that encompasses who he is and this is the reason why he says that the greatest command was to first love yah with all your heart soul and mind and also the second is like the first that you love your neighbor as yourself on these two hangs the torah and the prophets so the torah and the prophets is encompassed in the ten commandments is i mean you're not going to be able to get away from it is it's it's no and so the, just for you to have that understanding and yes. to know that his torah and keeping his commandments is love and all of the and the fruits of the spirit that he wants to develop in us is love yes. you know those things that sometimes we don't want to go through but it is love because his son endured when he yes. was on the state dying mm -hmm. on the tree dying for us you know yeah. that's what yeah. the boy that was set before him caused him to stay up on that tree because he knew yes. what was going to happen because of it what was going to be the outcome so he suffered Mm -hmm. you know it was bruised for our transgression yes. and our iniquity so um it's you know he he builds up endurance and he builds up patience and and all of these fruits of the spirit that we must develop but when he, we when we're going through these things it is love even though we're not seeing it but he knows what yes. the outcome yes the growth and he knows what's going to take what is going to take for us to grow and to develop and we have to have the spirit 
we have to be able to endure to the end. We have to have patience. We have to be forbearing because all of these things is love. When I looked up there, when we found out what, um, what the true definition is, says Yah's love and what affection really, and what affection is, well, it's so deep. Yes. It is mm-hmm. not like the, what we think the romantic affection. Yes. It's so deep on so mm-hmm. many levels. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and when you did that thorough breakdown, I was just like, wow, you know, just to, just to see it up close and personal, you know what I'm saying? To really break it down because, you know, a lot of times we feel like, oh, you know, I love y'all. It's not an emotion. He's not an emotional person. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's, he's all about action. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. like scriptures say, let us not love in words mm-hmm. and in, you know, in his deeds, but in love. I mean, in our action. Not yes. with your mouth and just yes. in your mouth, but yes. with your, you know, he say they love me with their lips and their mouth. And they heart far from them. Yes. You know what I'm so yes. don't say this word is across the river where you gotta go swim to get it and up <laughs> like this word is right here very near and do it yes you have spirit you say you spirit feel like they say then don't talk about some i'm spirit feel but in the same breath um i can't can't nobody do all them things and you ain't spirit feel yes you ain't that's spirit true feel. you can't say both I can do all things through the Messiah that strengthens me. But then when it's keep the commandments, can't nobody do all them things. Okay, but you don't have spirit. You have spirit, you have the ability and the power to do it. And yes. And those who don't have the power over sin and can't stop sinning is because they don't have his spirit. They need to walk in obedience and he because he says he gives the spirit to those that obey. So um, I have you lead us out with the reading. Okay. And David blessed Yah before the eyes of all the congregation. And David said, Blessed are you, O Yah, the power of Israel, our Father forever and ever. To you, O Yah, be the greatness and the power and the high esteem and the victory and the majesty. For all in the heavens and the earth belongs to you. O Yah, yours is the kingdom, and you lift up yourself to all as head. And the riches and the honor come before you, and you rule over all. And in your hand is power and might. And it is in your hand to make great and to give strength to all. And now our power, we are giving thanks to you and giving praise to your high esteemed name. Oh, yeah, the power of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers. Keep this forever for the intent of the thoughts of the heart of your people and prepare their heart towards you. In Yeshua's name, so be it. So we want to truly thank you for uh, everyone who listens. I get messages all the time from many of my brethren who say they listen daily. They listen when they're at work or on the way to work or whenever they're not congregating. We want you to know how much we truly appreciate you. Uh, yes. Definitely listen to the teachings and we pray that you are being edified, you are being built up and that through these teachings that you, the, uh, you are being renewed. And, um, and the sinful nature is being removed and that you are uh, returning and being a reflection of the true image of our Abiyah. So having said that, may Yah bless and keep thee. May he make his face shine upon thee and be gracious to thee. May he lift up his countenance upon thee and give you peace in Yeshua's name. Shabbat Shalom. much confusion we've decided to unify we won't let the vision die we know there is a greater purpose one aim one destiny and we'll all stay aligned to what's preferred by Yah man keep his hand in the hand of Yah with woman by his side, our children will follow, and together in unity we'll shine and glorify Yah. Together forever we'll glorify Yah. In unity together we'll glorify Yah. In truth and in unity, one love, one day.
destiny, one great God family, in truth and in unity, one love, one destiny, one great God family. Yeah. Nothing will ever come between us. Our bond is tight. Doing what's required and what's right. No, there is a greater purpose. One aim, one destiny. And we'll all stay aligned to us. Preferred by you Man, keep his hand in the hand of young With woman by his side Our children will follow Together in unity we'll shine And glorify you Together forever we'll glorify you In unity together we'll glorify One love, one destiny, one great God family, in truth and in unity. One love, one destiny, one great God family. Young gave us back to one another. He opened up our eyes and he gave us the gifts of a young We know there is a greater purpose. One aim, one destiny, and we'll all stay alive to us. Preferred by young. Man, keep those hands in the hands of young. With woman by your side, our children will follow. One love, one destiny. One love.